Hello, um, I'm here to talk about the public-private hybrid cloud, um, the unique challenges there. Um, I inherited this, so um, I'm changing the sort of direction of this a little bit, and I'm focusing it on gathering information from different areas and, and what we're doing with the CMDB. The capacity that I'm here is um, working as a in the CMDB um, ops track, where we're trying to figure out how to do that and uh, how we will get a blueprint to start working in that direction. Um, what I'd like to do is cover one of the things that we did inside of HP uh, to actually collect information and um, how we did that and perhaps how we could build a framework around that sort of uh, fabric of, of data collection. And uh, in that vein, I'm going to set out a scenario and then I'm going to actually show the um, payload headers that we used. Um, this is sort of a suggested format. It's not something that the committee's agreed on or anything. It's just the sort of direction that we're going in. Um, and then I'd like to set the stage for sort of what the CMDB area might be going in and what we're going to be working on. Um, a quick recap of um, what we call ETL, uh, Extract, Transform, Load, and um, versus Federation. So Extract, Transform, and Load is exactly what it sounds like. You go out to your data sources, um, the ones that are authoritative on the actual information that you're interested in. You extract that information out, you pull it to where, where you um, put some system where you transform it into a format that you need, and then you put it in a system where you're storing it, whatever DB you're using. Um, this is kind of nice um, because it allows you to pull that data out and then you can do some pretty complex queries on it and you don't have to worry about loading your systems, you know, your actual cloud system that you're doing work with. And then you've got the ability to, um, at least the way we designed it, to accommodate loss and I'll kind of describe how that works. And what's nice is you've then also got a way of dealing with history. So you've got history in, the, in your system, which perhaps you don't have in, a, in another approach. Now, in federation, um, and what I'm calling federation, and people have different meanings for that, when you look at it, um, it's a way of just reaching out to an API and gathering the information you want. So you could imagine um, if I was looking for a piece of information that's spread across you know, some complex of um, what my customers are doing, and I wanted to get something about some information about the tenant ID, I'd have to go out to the Nova, Neutron, Cinder, all these different places and pull this together and sort of do it dynamically in real time. So that's kind of what Federation is talking about. And that's useful for I want to know the information right now because those are very accurate and you're going to have exactly what you're looking for. So let me set the scene of a, a kind of an example for you. Um, imagine we've got multiple environments here, just one, two, and three, but you can imagine public, private, hybrid, whatever you've got. And off of that, then we've got two types of um, the, um, systems that are collecting data that are authoritative there. So we've got one that's sort of a local system, which is there's one per each environment, and then we've got another one that's global. And the global one um, is always sort of doing some kind of aggregating. It's pulling data out for you. And then what we'd look at is maybe some kind of queue, RabbitMQ, something like that and then some kind of driver, then dropping it into a store of some kind. Now, for what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about, let's imagine that we're going to talk about inventory, and so I've got all these racks of equipment, and then I've got some way that I'm provisioning this data up, so I'm provisioning these servers up to do different things. So I imagine I've got a couple of different systems to do this. Um, so one of them is going to be local, and I'm going to imagine it's for pro provisioning. So this is a system that would go out and uh, put, put my bare metal into a particular state, get it configured, the BIOS firmware RAID. Um, so each, system, each of these systems that are local would have a very limited scope. They only know about their environment that they're running in. And so I need to stop the potential of having clashes. So what we do is we make sure that each one of these systems has a unique ID. And so um, I'll come on to that a little bit, but let me just touch on some of the information that you might get in a provisioning system, or at least what we have in one of ours. Um, a fully qualified domain name, a serial number of the box, what OS it's been provisioned with. And because we were using Chef at the time, um, you'd actually have a role that would be applied to it to, for Chef. In a, in a global source that we've got, um, we have a, the ability to go out and actually scan all the, the racks and get the information about the elevation and where all the different things are placed. Um, so that's useful for us to be able to go and find things physically. 
And here you've got the scope is global. It covers the whole environment. But we've still got an idea attached to that. Um, but I'm going to add another concept to it. So this is a particular source of data. We've got two different types of records. We've got the actual racks, which each one rack is a, has a piece of information associated with it about where it's parked um, and anything else that you might want to add to that. And then within the rack, you've got each of the slots and, and what those are. So we've got the, the rack info and then the actual contents. And then you can see like what the rack info has the uh, data center and the tile location. The other one has a product ID and, and what elevation it's at. So let me just kind of work through this. So the first thing we did was we've got that payload and we want to put it in somewhere. But let's just kind of separate that out. So we put it under a payload header and just make that separate. And that's where we would put that data. So the next thing that we do is, um, at least what we've been doing, is we've got these agents producing this data, and we're very worried about that we might need to change things in the future. So we've put a version number on it, and what we did was we put a major version in it, and then that just means as long as that version doesn't change, it's compatible, and then actually as the data flows through, um, potentially consumers using that data would know whether it's still the same version or not. Um, there's the ability to put minor version numbers in there or anything else that makes sense, like in SHA-1 or something like that, that can help you. Um, figure that out. Then a uh, very important thing was to put um, timestamps in here. And so what we actually did was epoch seconds everywhere, which works out really nicely. Um, but we also put some um, ISO dates in there for human readability. They're not used in any sense, but it's nice when you're looking at records and trying to debug and figure out where things are going wrong to be able to see what the actual date and time is. Um, I'll just mention this. The batch is when is if you're sending a set of records, so if I'm going to the system that knows about all the racks, it can send me all the racks, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and it'll send it as 10 separate records. And then I know that they all belong to the same record set because they came out at the same time. If it took a long while to process, um, they say I could only get one record out every 10 seconds, then the actual record the time the record was last updated, so you can see back when how stale the data might be, um, that would then, then come as a different value. But the batch one is important, I'll explain why in a minute. And then we also want to know where it came from. So we've got this um, idea of a system, and here you can see I've got some kind of system. We use the FQDN, that's pretty, pretty unique and it's kind of nice. Um, and we're talking about the actual subtype of the data. So in this case, it's the rack info, not the rack contents. And then location, which would be, in this case, we had that one, two, and three. So it's like availability zone or data center or something like that. So it's ability to say where, where this is coming from. And then finally, um, we've got a number of message type headers. And I'm going to talk about those in a moment. So remember, I was just talking about a snapshot. So this is the mass snapshot type. And then in that, we've got also this record ID. And the record is important, because if I'm going to talk about this particular um, compute server or something, I might be moving it around, and I want to be able to identify it. So in this way, I can now say it's some, some unit. Oh, actually, this, this, this example is a rack. So it's a particular rack. It's num rack number 99. And we know it's managed by this particular system. So let's dive into the implementation a little bit. Um, we know that we're going to have a large number of systems. We know we're going to have some s very small error rate, but they're still going to communicate into s turn around into some degree of loss. So we wanted to build a system that's a little bit tolerant of loss. Um, we wanted to be considerate of resources. We didn't want to hit too much heavy on anything. And also, um, we wanted to be able to have a system that could do history as well, but we also wanted to be able to easily access the latest. And then um, we wanted to follow an approach of using a flexible document schema. And when I say schema, I'm really talking about something that's really um, just a sort of an agreement on how the JSON documents would look like. Uh, anyway, um, so let me just talk about implementation-wise. We've got two buckets that we put in our data store. One is live and one is snapshot. So we have some event-based data that comes in. And we've got those two things. So what we do is we always keep the snapshot up to date. And the other one is we've got this live bucket. And the live bucket gets events, but it also gets, when the snapshot is complete, gets a complete copy of that. So we're always keeping those up to date um, so that you, you can imagine every eight hours we're getting this complete snapshot. And then as little changes occurring, maybe one rack has changed, then we just get that small bit of thing and ch update the live. So um, it gives us a nice balance of, of between use resource utilization and being able to keep things up and running. Um, 
So let me go over the, the various message types that we've got. We've got the snapshot that I just talked about. But if I send a bunch of records, I won't know if it's complete. So what I do is I have to send a record count as well. So that then if I've got 10 records, if I send 10 records and I send I've got a count of 10, then when I get that, then I know that it's good to process. So I can actually go ahead and just take those records, process them, and then put them into live. And the reason for this is you might be, it might be it was 11 before and you want to know that you need to delete one out of the live. So you need to make sure you've got all the records to be absolutely consistent. And then into the live, we have the ability to overwrite, which is take an existing one because we've got an event saying, oh, this single rack has changed. We've, we've pulled the box out. It doesn't belong there anymore. And so you want to be able to show that change. And finally, we delete things all the time. So that's just another operation that we've got. So the, for the snapshot size, this is, this is how we did it. It was just it's pretty much the same as the other header, except for now the source type is, uh, or the message type is snapshot size. And the, the, the in bold, you can see that there's just a single item that says size. And here the example is three. Um, overwrite, again, this one, again, you have to provide all the information. You've got the payload in there. It, it, but it's still, notice that you've got the same record ID that you had in the other one. So you can tie the, the snapshot to the live connection so that we can make that sure that we're getting the right data being updated. And again, with the delete, exactly the same thing. So let me talk about the, the direction that we're going in. Um, if we lose... If we lose, if you think about this system, the way it works, if we lose an event in, into the live, okay, so we've lost that, but we won't see it. But eventually, we'll do an update and the snapshot, and that'll get carried over to the live. So we know that eventually things will catch up and we'll soft correct over time, which is a nice feature. And if we lose a snapshot, then that's okay too. We'll just be another eight hours or whatever period of update that you choose to, to do. So it's, it's kind of a nice system in terms of, it's not completely real time, but it's, it's pretty close and it seems to see so healing and it works reasonably well. Um, a number of companies have arri arrived at this approach. We've been talking a lot with eBay um, and this, and they've got another thing called YIDB, which sort of works in a similar kind of way. And so we're thinking this might be a sort of a general pattern to move forward with. Um, the approach that we've taken is that it, we're using RabbitMQ. The Rabbit messages are generally fairly small. Um, and they're easy, and we do them for the size that we talk about record size. And then what happens is you've got um, the when it pulls into your your database or whatever, then it's very easy to search on. So let me just quickly finish up with where we're going with the CMDB blueprint, or what what I'm trying to achieve with the group is. So we figured out there's three parts to this. We've got the the collection part, we've got the actual storage part, and we've got the um, query part of this. So what I've just talked about is how we might start building out the collect part, and that's something we could get to fairly quickly and be able to deliver with everybody. So that's one of the things that we're sort of focusing on. And so what we'd like to do then is be able to build a community of practice around that, and then that would allow us to share common data collectors, so all the OpenStack stuff could be very easily done, and then we've actually got some of those we could share, and then people can do their ad hoc ones as they need, because people have got different things that they've implemented. So that's uh, the whole thing from me, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>